So let's start into our third part of the biotechnology lecture. And just re-emphasizing, this is a field that touches our lives daily. Literally everything we do, between the foods we eat, the energy we use, the way we grow crops, our healthcare, pharmaceuticals, etc. All of it's connected to biotechnology. Where's a component of biotechnology? So I want you guys definitely to get a strong handle on this because this is the relevancy of this topic is incredibly important, but so is the opportunity, or so are the opportunities that biotechnology presents to you guys as biology majors. So in the last lecture, we left off with DNA fingerprinting and talking about how we can use those little SNPs, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, to help identify differences between individuals. We can use the larger differences to identify species level difference, but the SNPs are important for individual differences within a population. So what gives each of us our unique genetic identity are those little SNPs. And we're often using those when we're looking at a crime scene analysis. So you have a crime scene, you have possible suspects, you have victims, and there's going to be DNA evidence. No matter how clever the criminal is, they're usually leaving behind some type of DNA evidence, whether it's a hair that fell off their head, it's saliva on a cigarette butt, it's a piece of gum they spit out, or skin under the victim's fingernails, the list goes on and on. There's usually DNA evidence left at a crime scene. So with current technology, we're able to identify whose DNA that is, or I should say we're able to prove whose DNA it is. If we don't know a potential suspect, it's hard to match them up to the actual crime scene. And this is why certain states and the federal government is possibly considering it, looking at databases, DNA databases. Now, that's something as a voter we all get to voice an opinion on if we think it's a good idea, a bad idea, should we do it, should we not do it. But that is something that is in consideration as a possibility. Do we put everybody in the DNA database so if we find DNA evidence at a crime scene, we go to the database and go, boop, matches up to so-and-so. Again, there are some possible negatives, some po benefits, but we want to weigh both sides of those decisions. Okay, so when we're analyzing DNA, different methods of DNA analysis, we can use different techniques. There's a southern blot technique for looking at DNA analysis. There's a thing called the northern blot where you're going to analyze RNA. The western blot analyzes proteins. I'm not going to have you guys looking at these and trying to look at the differences and extensively understand what's going on here. I just want to introduce these different techniques for analysis. So when, when you see these in a higher level genetics course or molecular biology course, you've heard of them and you understand that they are used to analyze different information. And one is for DNA, one is for RNA, and one is for analyzing proteins. Okay, so now the more important thing about biotechnology is looking at these applications. Where can we see biotechnology being used? Cloning. Yeah, it's happening. So this is a little picture from a Jurassic Park. So you think about those movies. They were cloning dinosaurs. And if you go to the link pasted there, or you go to YouTube and Google Jurassic Park cloning, you'll get plenty of videos. But that is a technology that was talked about in the movies back in the 90s when they first came out. We've been cloning things since the 70s. So we're getting better and better and better at it. If you're interested in the cloning of animals, go to the company called Viagen. That's the other link on the other side of the slide here. They have a website. Hey, you want to clone your racehorse? Send us this DNA. We'll get you a clone. You want to clone a prize cow or a prize bull? You even want to clone your pets, your cats, your dogs, etc.? It's all possible today.
So this does raise huge questions about the ethics behind it. And is this a good idea? Should we continue to do this? Should we grow this more and expand this possibility? Or is it something that, as a society, we want to steer away from? So I encourage you guys, explore it a bit more. Look at the pros, look at the cons, look at the basic techniques behind cloning. Um, an area that probably is more relevant and more applicable to us is the production of medicine, mass production of medicines. So let's talk about insulin. Insulin is produced by your pancreas. Pancreas secretes it. It works with breaking down um, fats into fatty acids, conversion of glucose in the liver, the glucose uptake in the muscles. It's an extremely important hormone. Well, think about diabetes. Somebody who is diabetic cannot or usually does not produce insulin. Either they're not producing enough or they're producing none at all and there are problems. So you look at the symptoms associated with insulin. You know, if it's untreated, it's a life-threatening issue. In our country, diabetes is one of the largest growing health concerns for our population. Huge issue. And as more people move into being diabetic, that increases premiums for insurance. That means everybody's cost goes up. Even if you're healthy and you don't have it, your costs go up because there's more people becoming diabetic and insurance has to cover the sick as well as the healthy. So we try to understand how can we use biotechnology for this? Well, insulin was originally derived from cows. They're mammals. They produce insulin just like us. They have a pancreas. But the problem years ago was a limited supply, which means high prices, some people developed allergic reactions because it was cow insulin versus human insulin. So it became problematic and it wasn't efficient to help the number of people who needed insulin. So there were diabetics that could not get insulin because they either didn't have the money or they didn't have the availability or they had allergic reactions, whatever the reason, it wasn't doing what we needed it to do. So biotechnology comes into the picture back in 1982. E. coli, that bacteria, our intestinal bacteria, was used to start producing insulin in mass quantities. So what was done, the gene for insulin production was isolated from a healthy human. So we looked at the phenotype and said, hey, you produce insulin, you're healthy, you're not diabetic. That's always a starting point. That gene was removed from the human cell. So now you have a piece of DNA that says how to make insulin that was spliced into a little loop of DNA called a plasmid. This came from the bacterial cell. So you take this plasmid, you splice it together with insulin gene from the human, you introduce that into a different bacterial cell, and now we call it recombinant DNA because you've combined different ones. We put that into a different bacterial cell, that bacteria starts multiplying, multiplying, and multiplying, and as it multiplies, it makes more bacteria that have the insulin gene, and as those bacterial cells go through their cell cycle, and they go through, wow, we need to follow the instructions in our genetic code, they hit the code that says insulin, and now they're producing insulin for us. It's extracted, purified, put in a little bottle, and sold at your local pharmacies. So next time, if you know anybody who's diabetic and they have insulin, or if you yourself use insulin, next time I encourage you guys, look at the label, and it says recombinant DNA origin. That means it came from the combination of DNA of different species to produce insulin. So November happens to be Diabetes Awareness Month. Keep that in mind. Cancer. October was breast cancer awareness. November is diabetes awareness. So the goal is using biotechnology wisely and safely and efficiently to benefit society. We use biotechnology heavily in the agricultural field. I mean, there's a lot of different plants produced through biotechnology. 
So these are some of the are the top 10 genetically modified foods. Some of them right here in Illinois. You know, we look at the corn, the soybeans, the potatoes, tomatoes, peas. We don't do a lot of canola here. We definitely don't do papaya or cottonseed or rice, but the dairy products as well. So there's a large, large scale involvement of biotechnology in today's agriculture. So with Illinois being a corn producing state, let's take a look at BT corn. Okay, this is a common corn grown. So if you guys live near a cornfield or drive past one, you look at all those acres and acres of corn, a lot of that corn is what's called BT corn. Now, BT is a gene from a bacterial cell called Bacillus thuringiensis. This gene produces a toxin. That gene was removed from the bacteria and inserted into the corn plant. So recombinant DNA, genetic engineering. And now when the corn plant grows, it produces a toxin. When this little insect called a corn borer eats its way into the corn plant, it's actually eating the toxin that kills the insect, kills the pest. Great! Pros. Hey, the yields go up. That means more money for farmers. We don't have to spray pesticides. That's environmentally beneficial. There's lots and lots and lots of positives with this type of corn, with BT corn. So again, look at the corn on the right, that is BT corn. The corn on the left, infected by the corn borer. This is going to get you a lot more money when you sell it compared to this one. So some great, great pros. But cons, well, the corn borer is evolving resistance. We're wiping out the, the weakest and leaving behind the strongest. So there's a resistance developing, which means BT corn in so many years won't be very useful anymore if it's not grown correctly. So we have to change and find a new one. Um, there's huge concerns about the collateral damage. What about other organisms that eat the corn? Other insects, other animals that will consume the corn, whether it's the pollen, whether it's the plant, the root system. What about us when we eat the corn? That's a potential concern. We don't have long-term research to show whether or not genetically modified foods are good or bad for us. That's the great concern. So there can be some great things. There are great things here, but there can also be some things of concern that, man, what if this stuff is actually harming us? And in the long run, it creates more health problems than benefits. So we always have to try to weigh those out. Uh, being in Illinois, another major one is Roundup Ready Soybeans. Follows the same concept as insulin, or I'm sorry, as uh, BT corn. A gene was inserted for the resistance to the herbicide Roundup. Roundup is a chemical that kills plants, certain plants. So when a farmer sprays their field with Roundup, they're going to kill anything growing in it, or most anything growing in it, which can be bad if you're trying to grow beans. So what has been done is genetically engineering beans to be resistant to Roundup. And we have Roundup-resistant corn, we have Roundup-resistant alfalfa, wheat. Most of the commercial crops have Roundup resistance inserted into them. So this way, if you look at the picture on the bottom right, that is a farm field outside of Petersburg, Illinois. If the farmer comes by and sprays this field with Roundup, they should only be killing the weeds and not the bean plants. Otherwise, how do you selectively spray your field and only kill weeds and not beans? If anybody's ever walked beans, where you walk beans and cut the weeds out, not a pleasant job. So Roundup resistance has eliminated the need for that type of manual labor and that type of job. Superficially, that sounds great. Oh, good Lord, I never have to walk beans again. But it's putting people out of work. So you think about it, it's not the greatest of jobs, but it's a job. It will make money for people willing to do it. So now genetic engineering is actually eliminating certain types of jobs. That definitely can be one of the negatives of it. But it improves crop yields, it improves the profit margin for the farmer, 
there's a positive. So again, the challenge is balancing out pros and cons when we look at biotechnology and genetic engineering. So we'll talk more about this in our next lecture.